The devastation of World War I was so horrific that people said this was the war to end all wars, that we would do everything we could to prevent this kind of destruction from ever happening again. So why was this war so much more destructive? There's a few reasons, but a big one is the Industrial Revolution. By 1914, the weapons of war are much more advanced than the weapons used against Napoleon in 1814, and these weapons could be mass-produced in factories now. Some of these weapons included machine guns, tanks, warships, and airplanes. One of the most famous warships was the Dreadnought, Fear Nothing, and it's the predecessor to the warships we see today. In addition, the use of submarines became much more common, with Germans using subs to prevent the U.S. from being able to send supplies over to our allies. The U.S. didn't fight in the war at first, they just sold supplies. The tanks weren't really effective because they'd get stuck in the bomb craters, but they sure did scare the men and horses. Yup, a lot of regiments were still using horses at this time. And as for the machine guns, they'd often jam, but it was still more effective than the single shot rifle. Another reason why this war was so deadly is because it was a war of attrition due to the use of trench warfare. A war of attrition is a defensive war instead of being primarily offensive. Troops would build trenches and when the call was given they'd go over the top into no man's land to fight the enemy. Often these trenches were only meters apart. Going over the top into no man's land essentially made you a target for the enemy snipers and men would get stuck in the barbed wire or pinned down by enemy fire. The conditions in these trenches were also horrible, with soldiers getting trench foot where their wet feet would rot and even parts could fall right off, like your heel. And there was lice and limited shelter from the elements. It was a terrible place to have to be. Another new technique of war that was horrific was the use of chemical weapons, specifically mustard and chlorine gas. It was quite frightening to see a cloud of poison heading your way, and at first there was limited protection against it. It was a dangerous weapon to use because if the wind shifted, you could end up attacking yourself. There was an important battle at Ypres where the Germans released chlorine gas and many of our allied troops ran away, but the Canadians stood their ground. How? Well, our soldiers peed on a rag and put it over their face to neutralize the effects of the chlorine. Think about it, why did they put chlorine in the pool? The Battle of Ypres is an important part of the Canadian national identity because it established our reputation for being very brave soldiers. Now there's been oodles of documentaries covering the events of the war and I just want to review some of the events that are the most important to our understandings for this unit. When the war breaks out, people of the world believe this is going to be a short battle. We'll see victory by Christmas, and it's a chance to increase national pride, so people are excited to go off to war. But a year later, we can see that this is becoming much worse than we imagined. We lose so many troops that eventually the Canadian government has to use conscription to get enough soldiers to the front. We're going to talk about the conscription crisis and some of those important battles for our identity in a future video. By 1915, Italy rejects their alliance with Germany and starts fighting with the Allied powers. They did this because they thought it was in their national interest. We told them that if we won, we'd give them more land to the north of Italy. In 1917, there's a revolution in Russia. Part of the revolutionary slogans was the promise of peace, land, and bread. To achieve that national peace, Russia signed a peace treaty with Germany in March of 1918 and officially leaves the war. So now the Germans can focus on the Western Front. This is a serious blow to our war effort, but luckily the U.S. had joined the war effort. Like I said, at first the Americans didn't want to join the war. They were isolationist and did not see why they should get involved, except of course to sell some weapons. But the Germans' use of unrestricted submarine warfare meant that the U.S. ships were being sunk. One of the more famous cases was the 1915 sinking of the Lusitania, which was a passenger ship. The U.S. media uses this to increase opposition to the Germans by painting them as bloodthirsty warriors who were willing to kill innocent women and children. And the media didn't report there was, in fact, a small cache of weapons on the ship. In addition to the attacks on U.S. ships, there's what's known as the Zimmerman Telegram. Zimmerman was a German official who sent a telegram to the Mexican government telling them that if the Mexicans would wage war on the U.S. to get back their territories, that would help the Germans to win the war in Europe because the Americans would be distracted, and later Germany could help the Mexicans win their war. Well, even though President Wilson did not want to send his country to war, he realized by April of 1917 he could no longer avoid it. The arrival of the American troops made all the difference, and by the end of the next year, the war was over. Things move pretty fast as the war comes to a close, with the Ottoman Empire collapsing in October and the Austro-Hungarian Empire asking for an armistice in early November. Then the German Kaiser flees and Germany finally stops fighting. We sign the armistice agreement on November 11th at 11 a.m., a significant date today for us to remember the efforts of soldiers who have fought for our freedom. Near the end of the war, U.S. President Wilson creates a plan for lasting peace. We call it Wilson's 14 points. Essentially, he wanted to create an atmosphere where something like the assassination of a national leader would not turn into another global conflict. He said that all nations should agree to open covenants of peace, in other words, no secret treaties. He also wanted to create new arms agreements that would reduce the number of deadly weapons in the world. Remember, it was the arms race that encouraged the declaration of war as the nation states wanted to use their new weapons. 
Wilson recommended freedom of navigation on the seas and to limit tariffs applied to foreign goods in order to encourage international trade. He understood that if nation states trade with each other, they're more likely to have a good relationship with each other. One of the really big ideas that Wilson had was the establishment of national boundaries based on ethnic self-determination, that national groups should be allowed to govern themselves. And in order to protect those national boundaries, Wilson recommended that an international organization be created. He called it the League of Nations. It's essentially version 1.0 of the UN. It would have a general assembly where nation states could meet and discuss issues instead of threatening each other. And there'd also be committees that would tackle global problems. Why would he propose these things? Well, of course he wants world peace, but it was also in his national interest to do so. A peaceful world means stability, and economies thrive in stability. In addition, this would give America the opportunity to be seen as a world leader in the establishment of a new world that avoided war. So in early spring of 1919, world leaders met at the Palace of Versailles to write the peace treaty that would officially end the war. Many nations participated in the Paris Peace Conference to write the Treaty of Versailles, but there's the big four we call them, Britain, France, the US, and Italy. All of these national leaders were focused on meeting the national interests of their own people, so some fought for lasting peace to avoid another war, while others argued for territorial advancement, and other nation states just wanted vengeance on those who'd waged such a destructive war. While Wilson's 14 points were taken into consideration, the ideas were not always followed, and this created the stage for World War II. The final treaty ended up focusing a lot on punishing the aggressor nations, especially Germany. The War Guilt Clause stated that Germany and her allies must accept the blame for the war, and that as such, they must pay reparations for the damage created. The reparations were so high that it impacted global economics, as Germany had to borrow money to pay the bill. One of the main sources of the loans was the U.S., and when the U.S. went into a Great Depression in 1929, they could no longer loan the Germans money, so they couldn't pay their reparations bill. Before this, Germany had failed to deliver on some of the reparations to France in 1922, so France invaded and took over the Ruhr region, creating political and economic instability. Speaking of the Ruhr, Germany was forbidden to have troops in the region to protect their own interests. The entire Rhineland had to be demilitarized as to weaken any threat to France. And the overall military power of Germany was severely reduced as the number of troops and warships had to be taken down to a level that would allow Germany only to defend itself against outside aggression and not be able to wage war. They were forbidden from Anschluss, which was a union with Austria, and Germany lost a significant amount of territory. These territorial changes included France getting back the Alsace-Lorraine region and Poland being restored to provide sovereignty for the Polish people. But in order to provide Poland with access to the sea, the border included what we call the Polish Corridor. Except this does not make sense because it splits up a piece of Germany with now what we call East Prussia separated from the rest of Germany. And the creation of Czechoslovakia takes a big chunk from the south of Germany called the Sudetenland and now Czechoslovakia is ruling over a region that's majority German. That doesn't fit with the idea of national self-determination that Wilson had recommended. And some of those territorial settlements are still causing problems to this day. Because the Ottoman Empire had collapsed, the writers of the treaty had to figure out what to do with that region in the Middle East. Britain and France essentially took control of the region by creating mandates, which is like a colony, but not quite to try and prevent the people from rebelling over colonial rulers. And if you keep up on current events, you know how nation states like Israel, Syria, and Iraq are doing. Not so great. In addition, the Kurdish people had been promised their own nation-state when they agreed to fight with us, but when the Treaty of Versailles was finished, the Kurds didn't have their state. Instead, they live in nation-states of Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and Iran, so a lot of Kurds today are fighting to gain their own independence. And the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire led to the creation of nation-states based on ethnic identities like Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia, but both of those no longer exist because the ethnic national interests within those nation states broke it into even smaller pieces. Let's look at the League of Nations for a second. The League had many successes. They were able to mediate small territorial conflicts between various e European nations, thus preventing another war from breaking out. In addition, they made advances in the areas of slavery, spread of diseases, workers' rights. But unfortunately, the League was not able to prevent two important land, gra land grabs, and this is what the League is remembered for. Because the policy of the League was to establish global peace, they did not agree with the use of force to stop aggression. Why would you hit somebody to tell them to stop hitting? So when Japan invaded Manchuria, the members of the League condemned the action but did little to stop it. Later, when Italy invaded Abyssinia, now known as Ethiopia, the League put some trade sanctions on Italy to punish them for it, but it did little to stop the Italians. When the Emperor of Ethiopia went to the League of Nations and asked for help to protect the sovereignty of his people, the League essentially did nothing because they were afraid that stronger action could cause another war. This weak response showed other leaders, like Hitler, that the organization was toothless and he shouldn't fear them. 
In addition, membership in the League was a controversial issue. Some countries like the Soviet Union and Germany weren't part of the League early on, and both nations left the organization before the beginning of World War II. Japan and Italy both leave after they're reprimanded for their aggression, and the U.S. never joined. They wanted to continue the isolationist stance of staying out of European conflicts and felt that belonging to the League would force them to get involved. Yep, it's ironic that the idea for the organization came from the American president, and yet the Americans didn't join because it's a democracy and the representatives of the people voted against it. So by 1939, the League is useless in preventing the outbreak of World War II. Now, just so you know, today the UN does have provisions for the use of force against an aggressor nation. So as nation states around the world sought to satisfy their own national interests, it creates more conflicts around the globe. The harsh conditions of the Treaty of Versailles create territorial conflicts and economic crisis, and the weak authority of the League of Nations sets the stage for yet another, even more destructive war to break out in 1939.